Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samlick, and I'm a professor of economics and the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Brooks Family Lecture. Established in 1990 by a gift from Dexter Brooks, the Brooks Family Lecture has been a mainstay of Rockefeller Center programming for the past two decades. Through this lecture series, we seek to bring experts to campus who have unique perspectives on public policy challenges that face us at all levels of government and society. The coming battles over Social Security, the subject for our lecture today, have been in the making for over three decades. From shortly after the last major reform of Social Security in 1983, it has been clear to those of us in academic and policy circles who study Social Security that its projected financial health would last only until about the present. Social Security operates on a largely pay-as-you-go system in which most of today's contributions paid in by workers and their employers go to finance the benefits of today's retirees. The last three decades have been an experiment in pre-funding. We enjoyed surpluses because we raised payroll taxes and raised retirement ages in advance of the baby boom generation's peak earning years. When the baby boom generation predictably re reached retirement age, those surpluses swung to annual deficits. The Great Recession pushed Social Security's annual balance permanently into the red a few years earlier than projected. Challenges are particularly acute in the part of Social Security that provides disability insurance. Our speaker today, Michael Astru, served as the Commissioner of Social Security from 2007 to 2013, and so he had the distinction of trying to manage the administration of our oldest and most revered social insurance program at this inflection point in its history. As Commissioner, he regularly urged Congress to address Social Security's long-term financial challenges. Just as importantly, he sought to improve the operational efficiency of Social Security. During his six-year term, Commissioner Astru overhauled the agency's antiquated IT systems, reduced backlogs, created fast tracks for patients with severe rare disorders, and significantly improved the economic information provided to the public as people made their retirement choices. Prior to his term at Social Security, he split his career between the public service and work in the private sector. An honors graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School, he subsequently clerked for the Honorable Walter J. Skinner in the Federal District Court of Massachusetts. In the public sector, he served as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services Lit Legislation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Counselor to the Commissioner of Social Security, Associate Counsel to Presidents Reagan and Bush, and General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He successfully tried the first federal HIV discrimination enforcement case and successfully argued the first federal patient dumping enforcement case. Around his stints in government, Mike worked in prominent Boston law firms and for 14 years in the biotech industry, most notably as General Counsel of Biogen and as the CEO brought in to lead the highly successful turnaround of TKT. He also taught biotech law and policy at Boston University and served as the chairman of the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council. He has received numerous awards and honors, including the Public Health Leadership Award from the National Asso Organization of Rare Disorders and the Humanitarian of the Year Award from the Alzheimer's Association. Michael Astru brings a wealth of insight and experience to discuss with us the political and policy implications of the financial challenges faced by Social Security and the ways in which we might reform the program to better meet the needs we will all face in old age, survivorship, and disability. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Astru. Thank you, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. And my thanks to um, the whole Dartmouth community, which has been very welcoming um, already in my stay today. I've enjoyed the classes. I've enjoyed the informal meetings, um, the interview. And I'm looking forward um, to my day more in my retired CEO capacity um, over at Tuck. Um, it's also um, a special um, kick to be at an institution named after Nelson Rockefeller. <clears throat> in 1968, 
I was not a fan of either Hubert Humphrey or Richard Nixon. And in my school's mock election, I was one of the five of 240 people who wrote in Nelson Rockefeller um, for president that year. So I'm, I'm doubly glad to be in a place that carries on um, his legacy. Um, being back here in New Hampshire um, has also made me smile because um, it reminded me of the volunteer field work I did here in the New Hampshire primary uh, New Hampshire primary campaign a number of years ago when I was a young father. Um, and I learned three very important lessons um, from that experience. One is it is very, very cold here in January. <laughs> Second, you're much more likely to get invited inside to warm up if you have cute children with you. So if you don't have them, borrow them. Um, and lesson three is if you expose your children to public service at a young age, 20 years later, you may, may be the very proud parent of a Teach for America alum who's in the very small group who has stayed on mission and is still teaching in inner city schools, uh, and a son who's a veteran of very tough duty uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so this is um, an enormous opportunity. Whatever your age, whoever you are, um, it is a great rite of passage to have the opportunity to get involved um, in the New Hampshire primary. And you think about how often it has changed the course of the country. I'm old enough to remember um, Eugene McCarthy in 1968. So um, whether you're a supporter of Elizabeth Warren or Michelle Bachman or, like me, probably somebody in between, um, I really would encourage you um, to take advantage of your opportunity um, to take part in a, uh, a great national tradition. Um, let me turn now to Social Security. It is, in my opinion, the nation's most successful domestic program. It is not a welfare program, but it is still the best anti-poverty program that this country has ever created. It is very easy to forget that in 1935, far more than half of the nation's elderly lived in poverty, um, and not just poverty, but crushing poverty. And today, um, the percentage of the elderly living in poverty is about 10%, um, not acceptable, um, but a far greater improvement from where we were uh, when this program started. And most of that, I think, is due to the influence of Social Security. It is also an extremely well-run program. Um, its administrative costs um, run very favorably compared to insurance companies um, and other comparable companies, even though the payout is relatively low. In some sense, a private insurance company has a bigger advantage because they will pay out larger chunks of money if they're a health insurance company or a life insurance company. Um, and so they have a, <coughs> a group of people um, who have really done, I think, a splendid job um, for the most part, um, over time. Um, and it's a group of very dedicated people who are different from most um, civil servants. Um, it's an agency that recruits really for the field. The vast majority of people start in field offices. Um, they treat going to headquarters, I think, the way that priests treat going to the Vatican. It's something that they strive for and work for and are very moved to have the opportunity to do typically 20 to 25 years into their career. And it's also a place where um, it's located on a you know, fairly unattractive part of the outskirts of Baltimore. It's actually not even in Baltimore. It's in Baltimore County. And so it's not part of the, the Washington community and a lot of the negative things that go with that. And you also don't see a lot of people going back and forth um, between agencies. You don't see people from the agencies going to lobbying groups and that type of thing. It's largely a group of lifers. It's people who in college or in high school um, decided to accept an offer at, at Social Security. Um, you have a little bit of a dropout rate in the first two or three years and then pretty much everyone else stays until the end of their career. So you do get a dedication to serving the public and an understanding 
of an extremely complex program when it comes down to the details of individual cases, where I think the quality of service is far better than what any other federal agency um, supplies. And I'm obviously biased, but I, I'll, I'll take on anyone that wants to challenge me on that. I think I just got water on my computer thing here. I hope that doesn't hurt me later. Um, it's also um, increasingly an agency that has got with it in terms of electronic services. Um, there is a national survey out of the University of Michigan which rates not only all the federal um, electronic services, but also pro most of the private sector, including Amazon, eBay, um, and L.L. Bean and companies such as that, who are quite sophisticated about electronic services. And at least at the point where I left, I don't know about now, the top three rated were all Social Security electronic service programs, and four of the top five were Social Security um, programs, and, and became also the first federal agency to offer those services in Spanish. It's also important to remember that Social Security is not just a retirement program. And that's a problem that an education issue I often had, particularly even with Congress, which tends to forget about um, the many other things that the agency does. Um, it is a critical safety net program for about 10 million severely disabled Americans. It also provides coverage for children when the primary salary earner of a family dies. And if you want to talk to someone who is passionate about Social Security, talk to someone who received survivor benefits as a child after one or both parents died and felt that couldn't have gone to college, couldn't have done the other things in life um, without those benefits. And the program has produced a passion among people that you just don't see for many other um, worthwhile and not as worthwhile programs. You don't feel people, see people as passionate about Section 8 housing or student loans or small business administration grants. And I think that part of that goes to the original genius of the design of the program by Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt knew in 1935 that Social Security would be controversial and sensed that if old age, old age benefits were funded as a welfare program from general revenue, voter and congressional support would always be at risk. So against the advice of most of his advisors who were steeped in European, particularly Prussian models, he decided that Social Security should be a public pension program based on broad-based contributions rather than general revenue. And what that meant is that most Americans are keenly aware of the program through their paycheck because it is broken out and specified how much you're contributing to the program. And that has given it a sense, people a sense of ownership, connection, and expectation that you don't see um, with other federal programs. Um, because of that connection and because of the successes, the program became a bit of a, a juggernaut, um, argu arguably perhaps overexpanded in certain areas. And over time, Congress expanded the number of people contributing to almost the entire population and expanded the value and the types of benefits that it provided. In the early days of the program, these expansions were very cheap. There were originally about 35 workers for every retiree. Today, there are about three workers for every retiree, and that base of workers continues to drop. Benefits were also cheaper when life expectancy was so much shorter. In the 1930s, paying for retirees at age 62 or later was not expensive because life expectancy was 63. Today, with our life expectancy pushing 80, the cost of providing the same benefit um, is actually substantially more expensive. Um, and in fact, um, for the genetically superior here in the audience, i.e. the women, your life expectancy is already over the age of 80. So this has put a good pressure, a pressure on the system, a good pressure. Everyone wants to see longer life, but it has meant that some of the assumptions of the original formula need to be revisited um, and adjusted. So where does that leave the younger generation? If you're 
under the age of 35, studies show that you do not have a lot of confidence that there will be any Social Security there for you at all. Um, when I first started discussing this subject, I used to debunk the urban legend that um, more young people believed in UFOs than their future Social Security benefits. But I gather there's been a poll now that actually shows that that's true, at least in, in one case. Um, and if you're among the people who believe that, the good news is you're wrong. Um, the bad news, and there is bad news, is that you will almost surely pay higher taxes than your predecessors and than what you're paying now, and you probably will not receive exactly the same level of benefits that you did before. If we were to start with a very sound assumption that Congress will do absolutely nothing to address a serious problem, it would cause this result. In 2033, the trust funds would pay out about 80% of current benefits for the next 56 years. In other words, the system would pay retirees in today's dollars an average monthly payment of about $1,050 instead of about $1,300. It's not a great deal compared to what people of my generation can expect, but it is still a substantial benefit at the end of the day. Let me talk a little bit about the trust fund concept because people get confused. There are even conspiracy theorists that are very active about the trust fund concept. So let me try to walk through a little bit what I mean when I, I talk about the trust fund. By statute, all payroll, payroll deductions go directly to the Treasury Department, which buys a special government Treasury bond with it. It's just one type of, of bond. And in recent years, the Chinese have been the biggest buyers of these bonds. From any kind of moral, legal, pragmatic, and international policy perspective, these bond, bonds are binding obligations. Economists, however, tend to be unimpressed by legalities, um, and they assume away the, these statutes and view the system as pay-as-you-go. And you will see um, studies and, and references to pay-as-you-go, and they're not entirely wrong either. If you start with um, the worldview of just following the money, the system tends to be viewed as insolvent when the system is taking in less money than it's paying out. And by that definition, we started the road to insolvency in 2009 on my watch. But I think the, the general view and the view that the actuaries and the Congress take is that insolvency starts at the point where the revenue from taxes and interest on the bonds will no longer pay the obligations of the program um, over the next 75 years. That 75-year definition is somewhat arbitrary, and um, a little thought experiment will probably reinforce that for you. So if you think back to 1939 and imagine that you were asked to make economic assumptions about our world today, how close the, could they have possibly have come? That was the year after the Department of Labor created the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, which is still used scarily today by the agency in making disability determinations, although I did start the process for replacing that. Um, and if you go through the original Dictionary of Occupational Titles, um, it's hilarious. You can't help but laugh. You, you assistant buggy whip inspectors and what you need to be to be an assistant buggy whip inspector or a gaslight bulb changer or, you know, any of those kinds of things. I've been in a bulbs, but, you know, those, those kinds of things. A world of apples and apps and, and the way we live today, it's just not something that's easy to project um, over 75 years. So I personally tend to think that the gold standard for solvency is a little bit overrated. And I also think that there isn't any chance that Congress can get together to, um, to achieve that goal. And so from my perspective, I think we need to be encouraging Congress to make incremental changes in the right direction. Um, and um, 
and basically do our best to restore confidence so that the people in this room who are undergraduates and it will be enter entering the labor market shortly will have some reasonable degree of confidence that there will be a benefit roughly similar to what people are receiving today will be there for them at the end of the day. Um, but I don't think that has to be done all in one fell swoop. And in fact, I don't think Congress is capable of doing that. Um, in the last financial crisis of the system, it was caused uh, apparently by inadvertent doubling of the cost of living index in the 1970s, apparently by my congressman at the time, by the way, James Burke of Massachusetts. And that problem lingered for a few years. Um, there was some reluctance to um, deal with it, but if you can think about if your double, if your cost of living adjustment is twice what it should be every year, that's a pretty significant drain um, on your um, resources. So Washington did come together in that time period. In the early 80s, we had the Greenspan Commission, bipartisan commission, and that largely laid the groundwork for a bipartisan compromise worked out to some extent between um, one of my former employees and uh, employers and one of my former congressmen, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. At the moment, though, it is almost impossible to imagine a revival of that template. Those kinds of discussions just are not happening in Washington, and many of us are not optimistic that they will be happening anytime soon. A number of you may remember that in the previous Bush administration, the president made fundamental change to the trust funds a key priority in the form of private accounts. Um, and as you know, that became an inflamed political issue, and President Bush's um, initiative ultimately failed. My view is that the fundamental concept of diversifying your holdings um, in any sort of portfolio you hold is a fairly basic and important one. So I actually find private ac accounts compelling as a theoretical <coughs> matter. If I were asked to design a social security system in a developing nation, and at any given point in time, there usually are one or two developing nations that are creating a social security system, um, I would recommend private accounts. Um, but it would be very difficult for us where we are now, where we're running um, uh, a fund that's already insolvent, we don't have full funding. The transition costs of moving to um, private accounts on top of needing to fix the fiscal mess that we need make it very, very difficult um, to move at this point in time to private accounts. And I think um, probably made the result in the Bush administration um, inevitable. But to re reinforce my point, because I know that because of the politics, there are people that probably in this room that are still hostile to the idea of um, private accounts and, and private investment. I just thought I'd share one anecdote um, with you. So I was happily minding my own business in my Baltimore headquarters some point in probably 2010. Um, and I'd had, I think it was a Friday, I'd had a busy week, and I had a busy schedule that day. And my chief of staff comes in and says, the State Department needs you in Washington. And I said, really? What for? And she said, the Chinese Social Security Commissioner is in town, and apparently he really wants to talk to you. And I said, you know, this is kind of short notice. I've got a lot of important things I'm going doing here. Do you know what he wants? And she said, no, the State Department, you know, doesn't seem to know. I said, well, go back and talk to them and try to find out. Talk to him. Never found out. And so I said, well, forget it. I'm not going. And then we got some threatening calls from Secretary Clinton's office about going to the White House and complaining about certain things. And, we said, and I said, well, all right, I'll go. So I went down, changed my schedule, met the man. Very interesting guy. Um, studied accounting just as the Cultural Revolution hit. Was sent to work out in the fields for 10 years picking crops. Cultural Revolution ended. He went from picking crops to running the second largest bank in China. 
with nothing in between. Um, and apparently is widely admired. He's known as sort of the Warren Buffett of, of China. So I got all this information on the ride down. I'm, and I'm getting real curious, like, what are we going to be talking about? And so I get down there, and I brought my own translator. Um, he had his, and it kind of you know, looked like one of those diplomatic things. And he's very charming. And you know, we're doing some chit chat. And I'm dying of curiosity. Like, I can tell he wants something from me. And after about 15, 20 minutes, he clears his throat. And I said, OK, here comes the ask. And he said, I want you to know that I'm in New York and Washington to check on my stock and bond investments for the Chinese Social Security Trust Funds. And I figure you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. And I want to see if you have any tips or advice for me on investing um, the funds. And I'm trying to keep a straight diplomatic face. And I say, well, I'm really sorry, but by statute, we're only allowed to invest in one um, form of government treasury bond, and we sell a lot of those to your government. And he looked, and he was profoundly disappointed. And then he lectured me on how Americans needed to be more free market oriented <laughs> and, and, and invest more prudently social security funds. And I'm sitting there like, this is starting to be a surreal experience. You know, I was one of those dorky kids in high school that did college that did debate with the, you know, the bad ties and things. And I remember getting debate topics that included the phrase red China. And so I'm, I'm that, so all of a sudden to have a Chinese official lecturing me on Americans' lack of commitment to the free market was a very strange experience. But so it's not an alien concept because even allegedly communist governments around uh, the, uh, the world have embraced invice, investment in, in private funds. Um, so since Congress isn't going to change uh, an investment scheme, even if it's mocked by communist countries. Arithmetic leaves us with two basic approaches. We can either raise taxes or cut benefits, both of which are fraught with political peril. There are almost an infinite number of ways when you get into the detail to decide how to do that, but I think I can um, talk about the general issues for a few minutes without numbing your brains too badly. Um, the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party has generally embraced the approach of lifting the cap on Social Security taxes. Right now, your Social Security contributions, except for your Medicare contribution, are capped at approximately $110,000. So that means the maximum that anyone puts into the system in any given year is approximately $8,000. Um, and um, I, and I think that's a reasonable approach in some way, and I think probably there's some historical inevitability to some lifting of the cap. What I'm more disturbed by is that has morphed into a proposal to raise taxes to the limit by that mechanism. In other words, eliminate the cap entirely, which would get trillions of dollars of taxation, and then use it not to uh, address the fiscal situation, but to expand benefits. Now, in the short run, that's very popular. Um, you know, there are people who love the system and they said, well, you're going to get more benefits, people like that. Um, and people don't usually, you know, um, charge, write angry letters to their members of Congress saying, why don't you be a little bit more fiscally um, responsible? But if you look at the approaches, um, my senior senator, Senator Warren, Senator Begich um, in Alaska have gone down this road. Um, as far as I know, the Warren bill hasn't been scored by CBO, um, but the Begich bill, which I gather is pretty similar to the Warren bill has, and only about 3% of the revenue raised under the Begich proposal goes toward solvency. The rest goes um, for new, new benefits. Um, on the other hand, you know, you have a fairly entrenched Republican position which wants to go um, generally in the direction of cuts. And the question really has been how much of it will be from raising the retirement age um, and how much it will, it will be by 
adjusting the cost of living, uh, the cost of living adjustment. So um, let me talk about that um, a little bit more for a moment. Um, I think the, the, the real, there's, there's some obvious risks with the Warren baggage approach. I mean, fiscally, um, I think it's, it's certainly reckless to raise taxes to, to that extent, particularly with the other taxes that have been imposed on the public uh, in recent years for other domestic programs. But if you are going to do it, I think you should at least adopt the principle that we should pay for the insurance programs that we already have. And I think that the trouble with this is this really moves us away from a contribution approach. Um, I didn't agree with Senator Kennedy's um, chief advisor on Social Security on a lot of things, the late former Commissioner Robert Ball, but one of the things he and I do agree on is that <coughs> if you move the system too far away from insurance principles, and there are welfare aspects um, of the system, the benefit are, um, are progressive. So if you're at the bottom of the economic um, spectrum, you, you get more per dollar per in than a wealthier person would. But if you move away from, I think, the original genius of FDR in, in making this very contractual between individuals and the public, it does become just another welfare program. And then I think public support erodes and then I think in terms of benefits, you have people actually moving backwards um, instead of forwards. So it's not an approach um, that, uh, that I support. So when you get to the Republican side, I don't think there's a clear alternative. Generally, there's a resistance to raising taxes at all. I think some tax increases are going to have to come at some point um, as part of a compromise. But um, the debate generally is between um, adjusting the cost of living, which interestingly the Obama administration is quite supportive of, um, as was the Clinton administration. It's a little surprising to me there was a point in the budget conversations where it looked like that might actually happen. What seemed to be easier to do in Europe when there was um, financial trauma um, in Europe a couple of years ago um, is raising retirement um, age. But I do think that there will be some combination um, at some point in time of some adjustment to the cost of living and an increase in the retirement age, probably about two years. Um, and that's a position probably that the right and to some extent the center will take. And at some point the question will really be, is there going to be some catalyst to agreement? And it's not clear in the short run, at least when it comes to retirement and survivors, that that will come anytime soon. Um, but perhaps at some point. Um, the, immediate crisis that the agency and the system is facing um, is on the disability side. And that's something that people are less familiar with. It is a tough statutory standard. You have to be unable to do work that exists in the national economy for a period of 12 months um, or more. Um, although there are clever ways around that and there is a certain amount of fraud and close calls and non-fraud but people who should not um, be on, it's a very difficult standard um, to enforce. Um, Congress has been looking the other way at the fiscal issue with the Disability Trust Fund for a long time. In 1994, the trustees projected that the trust funds would be out of money for disability in 2016. Um, and that that was primarily due to increase of baby boomers and the effect of women coming into the, into the job market. Because in prior to 94, a lot of women did not qualify for disability because they did not have enough um, recent quarters of employment to qualify under the statute, where much more often now um, women do. Um, and what that means is that in less than two years, actually, you know, right in the heat of the presidential election, um, benefits will be cut somewhere between 75 and 80 percent 
to, to, to 75 to 80 percent of what they are now for every disabled person in the country. Um, and it's possible that, that Congress will play um, chicken with that. Um, I don't think that the solution from the left, which is just simply borrow from the retirement trust fund, is going to work this time around. And I think the more conservative members of the Congress are going to insist on um, programmatic reforms um, as part of the cost for bailing out the disability trust funds. Um, there are a number of things that I think um, make sense that I think are probable to happen. Um, right now, um, wage data gets to Social Security on a delayed basis because it's annual reporting nowadays for large employers, employers and whether that's 50 employees or more, 100 employees or more, um, it's all electronic and there would be no real burden by making that quarterly, which was the way it was before 1974. Um, to get that data earlier will allow the agency to do its disability reviews based on income reports a lot faster. Ultimately, that's kind toward people because if, we don't ca if the agency doesn't catch them in time, they've got a larger amount they have to repay. Um, it's also, I think, important to re-review these cases on a regular basis. There are about 40 percent of the um, recipients whose situation is not going to change. You know, my dad was a disability benefit at the age, uh, beneficiary at the age of 50, 52. He had the same rare brain cancer that Senator Kennedy had. So you know with 100 percent certainty that um, you're not going to make it. You're only going to go downhill. And in fact, you're probably not going to live the 24 months that you have to live to qualify for Medicare. Um, so I, th I, th I think that um, what they call continuing disability reviews pay back about $10 for every dollar. The budget chaos has kept the administrative budget too low to hit the optimal level. And so what you probably need to do, since these decisions are made at the state level, the federal government and the trust funds reimburse the states for the work they do. That's about a $2 billion expense out of an $11 billion administrative budget. If you put an automatic tap on the trust funds so that $2 billion to the states came automatically in exchange for setting a limit of about 750,000 of these reviews a year instead of the 300,000, you actually would get a very sizable benefit. You could probably get rid of about a third of the financial gap just by running the program on a tighter basis. There are other reforms. Um, right now, I think due to poor legislative drafting, you can collect unemployment compensation and Social Security disability at the same time. And for me, there's a fundamental disconnect between telling one agency you're unable to work for 12 months or more and telling another agency you're actively looking for work and you made three active contacts this month or how many active contacts you're, you're required to make uh, looking for work on unemployment comp. There are also some other um, add-ons to Social Security that I think probably should be eliminated to um, support the Disability Trust Fund. My favorite has been what I always call the, the trophy wife benefit. Um, a lot of people don't realize that retirees who have children can get benefits for those children. So you think about that. That's, there, there are some cases where you say, a few, where you say, okay, maybe there's a legitimate societal purpose. There are these admirable grandparents that have adopt children when, they're, when their own children have passed away or are in jail or or do things like that. I've known some families like that. But by and large, it's people, it's men a little bit older than me who are on second, third, or fourth wives and starting families again. And I don't see any reason, personally, why the federal government should be supporting their children. The federal government certainly didn't support my children when I could have used some help. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a very sexist skewed benefit because it is extremely rare for a woman to take advantage, and women, women can technically take it. It's usually, you know, it's through adopted children. It does happen once in a while, um, but it's one of those sort of add-ons that, when the system was flush, Congress said, "Well, let's create 
a benefit. It's not that expensive. But we're spending $2 billion a year on that benefit. Um, and I think it's time to take some of the add-ons like that um, and use that to fix something that's a much more fundamental part of the safety net. Um, I jumped around a little bit here. I think it's also um, important to remember um, when looking at disability um, that the agency also does run a welfare program for the low income, uh, disabled, um, and elderly. Um, and all told, um, we are a very compassionate nation. We're spending half a trillion dollars on Medicare and uh, an SSI, the Disability and Aged Welfare Program, um, every year. And that is also, I think, um, a, a backstop um, for some of these other cuts that, that we might have to make. Because at some point, um, you raise the retirement age, it is going to put more pressure on the disability system and making sure that particularly um, the lower income um, disabled people don't suffer um, with those kind of transitions is, I think, important. Um, okay, so I want to go a little bit to what my time was like. It was a time when Congress was not terribly interested um, in legislating. Congress hasn't done even borderline significant legislation in Social Security since 1999. Once you get the reputation for being the third rail of American politics, there's not much motivation for um, opening up. Um, and my timing, as often in my political career, tended to be poor. So I got to the agency just as the media in Washington got worked up about um, disability hearing backlogs. One of the other things that the agency does is run the largest system of justice in the world, and there are about 1,500 administrative law judges who review cases. And under my predecessor, who diverted a lot of resources into an experiment to try to approve disability processing that was just kicking in as I was starting, um, that accelerated the backlogs and they were skyrocketing. And so I showed up just as the media and Congress got angry about that. In fact, on my third day of the job, I had uh, a hearing on the subject, and I had members shouting at me. I had one member shout at me questions, and when I saying I was a horrible person responsible for it all in my 72 hours on the job, and then when I tried to answer, cut me off and said, you haven't been there long enough to be able to answer these questions. <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about what we did do, because one of the things that I, I'm proud of is at the point of the 2008 CBS Piece. The waiting time for a hearing was in this country was 546 days, and <clears throat> if you were in Atlanta, it was 900 days, and there were cases that had been waiting as long as 1,400 days. And in part, the agency had done something unprincipled, um, which is to try to keep the numbers looking more reasonable. They triaged cases, so they did the newest cases first, and that made the numbers in terms of processing times look lower, but that also meant is there are cases waiting 1,400 days where nothing is happening. And, and you know, this is America. You, you, know, you shouldn't have to wait four years um, for, for a hearing. So we undid that, um, which made our numbers look worse for a while, made the CBS evening news thing a little bit harder, but it was the right thing to do. And what we started doing was a combination of streamlining processes, very old-fashioned government streamlining processes, and then using new tools of IT to move cases along more quickly without trying to change outcomes um, in most cases. So one of the things we were able to do with IT um, is fast track, identify and fast track the, case, the cases that really ought to just be allowed. Those are typically very rare diseases. Those are typically <coughs> cases where an examiner, CBS wasn't entirely wrong because the turnover at the state level 
typical examiner has about three years of experience. So they get good pretty fast at heart attacks and certain kinds of mental illness, but not on rare diseases. So when we did a retroactive study early in my time, we discovered that our error rate was not 6%, but 40% in those cases, and they typically kicked around the system for a long time. So now, having gone through the one-time effort to identify those cases and use the technology to pull them out quickly, um, if, you've, if you are one of the quarter million people who apply for disability <coughs> with one of these generally fatal rare diseases, the system will immediately pick your uh, claim out. It will shorten your form. You don't have to even ask, answer some of the questions that other people have to answer. And typically, you get a decision in about 10 days, sometimes within 24 hours. So that's not only compassionate, but it's also very efficient because these cases were kicking around an automatic pilot um, around the agency, then often wrongly decided, and then clogging the courts. So getting the, the cases, getting benefits quickly to the people who really deserve them um, was important. Um, we also... Um, had disparities around the country. We didn't plan for it. A lot of the hearing offices are small. Um, OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, often does not have a roster where you can hire new judges. So if one judge goes on maternity leave or retires or um, you know something else happens, um, you can get up to the 900 days in Atlanta very quickly. So we moved to um, rapid increase in video hearings. We had centralized judges. Um, who would handle cases in the most backlogged areas around the country. And it not only worked operationally, it was great for morale, because in places like Atlanta, where it was a 900-day wait, you went and visited them, and they were just like walking around like zombies because it was depressing for them not to be able to serve the public well. So getting the help that would get their numbers down, cut them in half in a short period of time, built the morale, improved the work um, going forward. So with all those kinds of techniques and a lot of other smaller things that we did, we were able, um, within three years of that CBS report, to take the waiting times down to about 340 days. It's a little bit north of what our goal was, but still, I think, a very um, substantial um, success. Um, and, and I think that the system has a lot of imperfections. But the people who drop out and don't apply that, so, that CBS was so worried about, there really is sort of an economic triaging going because I didn't show you the whole 60 Minutes report, but lawyers have moved in big time because Congress has created fee incentives to do so. But it's a sort of contingency fee. And so most of the people who are denied benefits at the first stage um, don't unilaterally decide not to pursue it any further. They go to the lawyers and say, will you take my case? And the lawyers are pretty cold-blooded about taking the cases that they think they can win quickly and not taking the cases that, that can't, can't win. So I think that the system is not as onerous and never was as the 2008 system. And the 2013 um, story of, of just giving away benefits. Um, it's, um, I, I think it's a motivation for making um, certain cuts in the program, which um, I think probably are going overboard. Um, the Coburn quote unquote study that they cite in 60 Minutes is basically his staff members with no training in this area going through cases of Coburn's constituents and others, which is a little scary in and of itself, and miraculously deciding that 25% of the cases were fraudulent because that was exactly the figure that Senator Coburn had been using for years. So that's not a real study. There are issues in the system. There is some, some fraud and abuse, um, but there probably is not fraud at the level that you actually can change the fiscal situation of the disability trust funds just by going after um, fraud. You need to do um, something else. So um, one of the other things that we did when I first got to Social Security, in order to free up resources, we um, made a lot of efficiencies on the programmatic side, particularly a move to electronic services, as I mentioned. Um, before, we had a lot of fraying, COBOL-based systems, and we moved to state-of-the-art 
um, IT for, for about three quarters um, of the agency, which made a huge difference in terms of doing things quickly um, and doing things well. Um, and one of the things I'm proud of is we set, I set the standard very early that if we're going to move into this area, we're going to do it right. The retirement application that we had online had been put up in 24 hours. An acting commissioner in 2001 had walked into a conference room and said, how come we don't have an online retirement application? Any idiot can do it in 24 hours. So of course we put up the only thing that we could do, which was the applica written application that claims reps use. And we don't even let claims representatives use that application until they've already been working for a year because it's complicated and it's not going to be clear to the layman. So we went back to get state-of-the-art, user-friendly um, services. It, we would pass review by the so-called experts, but I would make them go through it with me page by page. And we started doing things like saying please um, in the beginning, saying thank you at the end, getting rid of the jargon, both IT and social security. And that's how you get up to the level where your services are the best in the country. And then to end on a little bit more of a fun note, we have um, a slightly older demographic here than I might um, have anticipated. So this is good for this part because I don't have to do as much explaining. So we were broke. We didn't, you know, money was flowing into HHS. HHS spent 25 million, if I remember correctly, on the Andy Griffith ads for um, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, I would have been run out of town by Congress if I'd spent that kind of money on online services. So we did this cheap and dirty. We did this almost all in-house for $100,000. Our new spokesperson volunteered um, her time. And, um, and I'll show you the ad and the spokesperson in a moment. But I also um, said that you know, we've, we've got to write something that will go viral because we don't have the money to pay for ads. And my poor people, had, you know, they, they were very good at what we've been doing for decades, but they didn't get this. And I remember saying in a meeting, look, there are two things that go viral, sex and humor. We're the federal government. We can't do sex. You've got to make these ads funny. Um, and they still struggled with it. I actually ended up writing most of these ads myself. And then our spokesperson, if you're 55 or older, um, you will recognize immediately. You will recognize the theme music that we bought. If you're younger than that, then our spokeswoman did pin me against the wall one time and say, you know, your younger employees don't know who I am. What do you tell them about me? And I looked her right in the eye and said, I tell them that you were the Jennifer Aniston of 1962, <laughs> which was one of the smartest things I've ever done. So if we could, could we move to the ads? And then I'll take some questions. So the amazing thing about this ad is it hit a chord with the American public. I did what they call a virtual road show with her on this, where you rent satellite time. So you can get six hours of satellite time for $4,000. For $4, and the great thing about that is, while you can't get on the Today Show or that kind of thing, every city in this country has Good Morning Wichita, Good Morning Sacramento, and, you can, and they don't get celebrities at all. And they'll give you five to seven minutes instead of the two minutes. So we went over and over again. Um, and almost every time, a producer or somebody would get on and say, I just want to tell you how much I love that old show, and I'm so glad to see you, you know, back in... Um, circulation. We actually probably did revive her career. Um, she hadn't worked for four years when we called, and she's been working steadily. So she loves us to pieces. Um, she always worked for free. She did three rounds for ads. She did the road shows. She did anything we asked her to do. Um, for the third round of ads, we had a very awkward discussion in communications when I was talking about the last year. She did ads with George Takei from the old Star Trek. Um, and. Um, we wanted to go against type because Takei was also a little sensitive about being too Star Trek-y. And so I remember telling our Deputy Commissioner for Communications that given the new script, we needed to ask Patty if she were willing to wear pointy ears for the next ad. And my deputy pleaded with me, said, please don't make me ask her that. I said, oh, she's a good sport. She'll be fine. And so if you go onto YouTube, you can also find the ads with Patty um, doing that. Um, we went from 21% filing online to 32% in three weeks. We made the Conan O'Brien monologue. Um, 
three paragraphs in the New Yorker. Um, this was a huge hit. The other ads were good, they helped us, but this bailed us out because we did it originally to get ahead of the baby boom. And there had been a National Academy of Science report taking to task that we weren't ready on electric, electronic services. And that really became um, our Bible. But it really saved us because we didn't see the recession coming. So we saved about 15 minutes on every retirement application filed online with over 4 million people filing every year. You can kind of do the arithmetic. Total surprise to us, there was also a poll on the disability online, which only 5% of the public was using. It's up to about 40% now, and the agency probably saves about a half an hour on each of those things. So, but for retooling these services to do it the right way and a popular ad campaign, when the recession hit, we would have had lines outside our field offices that would have looked like lines in Moscow to buy toilet paper in 1977. So, um, these were fun, but they were for a serious purpose, and they really did help the agency um, move forward. So with that note, I'll stop, and I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Gentlemen, yeah, you had your hand up first. Uh, I'd like to go back to basics and ask you. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, th there, this is being recorded, so if you would wait for your question until you have the microphone, I know that Dartmouth would be grateful. Okay. I'd like to go back to basics and yeah. ask you about, as you said, the solution to the long-term problem, yeah. the liberal side says, let's raise the $108,000 limit cap up to uh, all income. Yeah. I might even add all income including dividends and interest income. I might even add uh, capital gains income to that. Then the other side would be, uh, I would think the Republican side that would say, we want to cut taxes. Well, if, have you done a calculation saying that if we, in terms of the fairness of paying for the system, if we actually raised and uh, uh, charged all income the same uh, percentage, could we lower the percentage uh, collected? If we lowered the percentage, let's say just to, to accomplish the same amount of money that you have right now as a start yeah. point, what would the percentage be if you, if you had a fair system where everyone paid in the same percentage? And by doing that, a lower percentage certainly would, uh, would uh, uh, add to the economy in terms of economic growth, giving more people more money to be able to spend. So my recollection on this, and, and I'm away from it for a while, and Congress didn't get terribly serious um, about this. so. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. My recollection is that simply lifting the cap in and of itself essentially solves your solvency problem and maybe gives you a small amount of money to play for, with, but not a lot. Um, if you went into all other forms of income, sure, you could then talk about um, cutting the tax rate um, as well. I think the risk there is what happens to public support for Social Security um, when you do that, when you, see, when you know that retirement benefits in real dollars are capped for the highest income people at about $30,000 a year, um, even, if, um, uh, so, and even if they put in far more than that, you know, on a sort of an actuarial basis. Um, if you, you know, have people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year into Social Security for a very small return at the end. You've essentially said it's not an insurance program anymore. It's a welfare program really being funded by um, general revenue. And the problem with that is I think support for the program erodes. It becomes just like any other welfare program. It becomes subject to attack. And I think at the end of the day, well, in theory, it may sound like a very egalitarian um, thing to do. I think it actually moves us backwards because I think it basically means the end of Social Security and I think that's a bad thing. Somebody else? Yeah. Up, oh, get the microphone. Um, just a follow up on that question. Yeah. Um, once you go beyond income, 
and you get into dividends and you get into um, the wealthier flows of income, uh, you reduce the percentage of people who are going to be gored significantly, right? Because the majority of in people in America now have an income well below those additional sources that were alluded to. So if only 10% of people are, are now gored beyond what they were before, why does that produce a loss of trust in Social Security and a perception of it as welfare? Well, so I, what I'm getting at is yeah. sort of the inequality of uh, income. Uh, so that if 90% really are not hurt and 10 are, yes, you may have lost the support of 10%. You don't necessarily lose the percent of 90%. Well, a couple things. So um, first of all, when you're talking about taxing dividends um, and capital gains, you do have to remember we have become much more of an ownership society than we, when we once were. 30, 40 years ago it would have been a relatively small percentage of the population. Right now, yeah. 30, 40 years ago, it would have been a relatively small percentage of the population that uh, had ownership of um, stocks. Now it's a much higher percentage, and a lot of people forget because it's indirect through pension funds and IRAs and um, 401ks um, and that kind of thing. So all those people would get hit. So it would not be, if you move in that direction, it would not be, you know, you wouldn't be getting Mitt Romney and the people that hang out with Mitt Romney on the weekend, you would be um, hitting a number of people, a lot of people in the upper middle classes, middle class, even working class um, people on a s somewhat random um, basis. And so it does raise some issues of inequality. But if you've eliminated the FICA cap and you're adding different forms of income, you will have really totally detached any real connection between contribution and benefits. There's some detachment now because it's, it is a regressive contribution system, but it is a progressive benefit formula. And so at some point, people who have been high earners in their life, even now with the cap, are putting a lot more into the system than they're ever going to take out <coughs> on an actuarial basis. So if you add all these new sources of income, the people who are contributing that are going to get zip from it. And the question is, how much can you tap from those sources before people say, what am I getting out of this was supposed to be an insurance system. This isn't an insurance system. I'm just subsidizing. You know, this is a wealth redistribution system. And you may be for wealth redistribution, but you shouldn't fool yourself that you can sort of do that, label it social insurance, and not have the public figure out figure that out. So, you know, you have to decide. You'd be taking a huge risk with popular support for the system if you get to the point where you're tapping so much revenue from one segment of the population in a way that where there's absolutely no connection to their ultimate benefit. Can I just have one follow-up? Sure. This gets to the IT issue. Yeah. With our ability to manipulate big data, this, and it's also getting to tip another Tip O'Neill motto, which is yeah. all politics are local. Yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah. So if one could design a what-if system that is available to every American and say, what if I did the proposal to tap all income and then generate the numbers as it would affect every level of income possibly affected by it? and translate the fairness issue as an abstract with an unstated percentage of where we lose faith and translate that into, it'll cost me five more dollars in taxes. It'll cost 0.01% $50,000 in taxes and see where the loyalties play out. Everybody will be able to see how it gores their own individual ox. I've asked somebody to design that kind of system, a what-if system. Google could do it. The government could do it. Some charitable group could do it. Probably an undergraduate group could yeah. do it. So, so look, I know that there, we're in a time period where there's an interest in income redistribution. Uh, I understand that. <clears throat> um, I'm not 
hugely in favor of that, to be honest. I'm not trying to hide anything. But, I w but regardless of that, I don't think there's any real likelihood that the Congress would take a proposal like that seriously. So, so if we could move to another category of question, if somebody ha Can I just ask, add one thing? Yeah. The other side of this is the stimulus side. Business should be in favor of this if you could lower the rate. No, exactly the opposite because right now, you know, FICA taxes are matched by business. People right. forget that. So when you increase the, the FICA limits up to the roof, business is also paying for that share of it. But so the that's going to go down. It's not going to go down very much, no. Well, that's what I'm asking is how much. No, you, if no, you no. What, it, if, if, you, if you go down this line, it is also going to be a huge business tax and, and particularly damaging for small businesses. Yeah. Oh, I thought you had. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but you're good. You're waiting for the microphone. I keep forgetting about the wait, waiting for the microphone thing. So earlier you mentioned um, possibly or that you had to debunk the myth that Social Security wouldn't be here for the younger generations. Yes. Rather than trying to debunk that, would it be more beneficial to use that as a tool to raise, or raise the retirement limit for the younger generations to help stymie that, the insolvency that we see? Given that when Social Security was created, it was set at a year older than life expectancy, wouldn't it make sense to raise back towards that if we have a 15 year gap now I, isn't that part of the problem? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not big on, on scaring people. Um, there's too much of that in Washington um, these days as it is. So my view is you need to get people to understand the mathematics and the economics and what the results are going to be if we don't do this or we do do this and get the, the dialogue started. I don't think I have a magic solution. I don't think anyone who really understands or cares about the system does. There are almost infinite number of ways to fix it that would probably be fine. The important thing is that Congress has got to get started on that, and they're looking the other way. And I'm really worried that for 2016, they're not going to be ready, and they're going to do something very abrupt and foolish um, in the disability program, because there are not hearings, there are not real hearings, there's no discussion, there's no legislation of a serious nature that's being debated, and we're two years away, maybe less than that, depending on what happens with the economy. And I just, I, I think we got to get that debate going and get it going as quickly as possible. Okay. I'll, I'll take this one more and then I think I'm, I'm getting the hook. Uh, thank you very much. So there's obviously an economic logic to raising the retirement age by a modest amount. And there's a, it certainly comports with many senses of fairness because the social contract should adapt with longevity. It does seem that the one fly in the ointment is disparities in longevity by race, by education, and yeah. by type of work. Is there a way to have it both ways, where you raise the retirement age but create some kind of carve out so that folks with, in those disadvantaged groups who have a lower life expectancy will still get a higher share of their yeah. benefits? That's a good and a very complicated question. So let me say a couple things. Um, it's the right question to ask. In some ways, I think it may not be as bad as you fear if you look at the system as a whole, because some of these things balance out um, to some extent. Um, on the racial and class issues, it is true that they don't get as high a benefit um, on the whole. But the, um, disadvantaged racial groups and lower income also put in less because of the oddness of the um, uh, regressivity um, of the system, and, and that kind of, they don't, they're not going to. They're going to be. Let me, let me rephrase that. They're going to get a higher benefit for every dollar they put in than um, a wealthy white guy would get. So there is some attempt to address equity. Um, in that fashion, and that's one of the reasons why we have, I think, the awkward situation. I don't want to suggest that it's an inherently fair system, but I do think you have to look at it as a whole. I believe it's also true that when you look at the disability program, as you would expect, it's used more 
by lower income people. And I believe it's also used a little bit higher by minorities as well. I'd have to go back and look at recent data. So if you look at the system as a whole, I think it looks a little bit better. Again, I'm not saying that there aren't inequities that we should be looking at overall, but I think it does um, look better when you look at it in that way. So with that, again, everybody's been wonderful. I've had a great time. I'm really glad you all came out, and thank you for listening to me.